brothers, sisters. We thank the Lord for His goodness and His mercy. He's been so good to us, you know. And today, when uh, the Lord took me again back to Ephesians 1, I mean, chapter 4, you know, this season the Lord says we should focus on two epistles. The epistle of Paul, the apostle, to the Ephesians, six chapters. The epistle of Paul to the Colossians, four chapters, ten chapters in this season. There's enough truth in them to actually unleash the grace of the Lord in everyone whose heart is open. And, you know, today it took me again to Philippians, I mean, Ephesians chapter four. You know, and I want to encourage you, make our time to study those Pauline epistles. They are gems. They are glorious truths that we need to be all the Lord wants us to be. To understand what Yeshua purchased for us at the cross of Calvary. Who he is in us and who we are in him. And we bless the Lord for you. On that note, we want to now go into the world today as we continue to go down the wire concerning cost 307, the fivefold apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, let your name be glorified. The key to life is to know you and to know what you've done for us at the cross. The key to life is to embrace truth and let truth redefine us, reconfigure our mindset. We therefore pray that your truth will come forth by your spirit. Give us clarity and understanding and let your name be glorified in Yeshua's name. Amen. Today, in lesson 39, we're going to discuss keys for restoration of the fivefold. What are the keys? And this cannot be all. We know in part, we see in part, we hear in part, and we speak in part. So I will be only sharing the part the Lord gave. And there may be other things the Lord revealed to you. Receive them also, add them to this, and we will be able to be all He wants us to be. What is the key? Number one is back to the world. If the fivefold will be restored, we need to just go back to the holy word and to understand the word in context, to know what the Lord says of his church. The Lord says of his church, his body, his bride, and what he has, the way he wants it to operate in the earth dream. That is very important. The second thing, the second key is one person. Men and brethren, as in all things of the Lord, all he needs is one man, one man, one man, one woman, one person, one person, one person who will know the truth, embrace the truth, be transformed by the truth, the mind renewed by the truth, and who is willing to run with the truth. One person in any environment, in any city, in any nation, one person who gets reformed will be an instrument of reformation. You know, Jeremiah 5, 1 says, Run ye to and fro the streets of Jerusalem. And see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, if there be any that executed judgment and seeketh truth, I'll pardon it. I remember also Ezekiel 32, you know, 22, 30, and I sought for a man who will make up the hedge. You know what he said in the book of Matthew 18, 18, that if you bind, is bound. If you lose, is loose. The things of the Lord start with one person. One person, it doesn't matter whether he's male or female, young or old, educated or not. Elohim is looking for an individual who surrender the whole heart and mind to him. Dead to ambitions, dead to desires, dead to preferences, dead to religious tendencies. This kind of dead saint will become alive in Yeshua. Love Elohim passionately. Desire to be all and do all that he's supposed to do. Listen, you know such a person? You think people will clap for that person? No. People are going to misunderstand him. People are going to misunderstand her. People are going to speak evil. People are going to discourage. But you know what? If it is the Lord that has called you, you don't fight for the Lord. You just allow the Lord to have his way. You are a mere vessel in his hand. You're dead. And Yeshua is living through you. Number three, the individual concerned will not want any trace of Babylon in the ministry. Reformation is radical. You don't want any trace of Babylon. As a matter of fact, you are coming out of Babylon in every way. You check the level of Babylon. When you have time, read Revelation 81 to 7. 
Babylon, why? Babylon is the prevailing spirit that rules the world. It's evident in all realms of life, politics, Babylon, strife, confusion, economic, the, the, the stronger, they take over the weaker and exploit, exploit their resources, social level, things that are contrary to the Lord, social norms that are contrary to the Lord, cultural, cultures that are absolutely opposite to the Lord, educational, that lead people to think outside the way of the Lord. In the religious realm, Babylon, its toxicity is at an extreme level because it creates a religious system that looks like, feels like, smells like, but is not of Elohim. And so the focus is on the wrong things, the buildings, ABC, attendance, building, cash. And so, men and brethren, ignorance is no excuse, as Hosea 4, 6 says. Now, let, let's look at a few things about Babylon that everyone truly called by the Lord must be aware of. 3.1, enthronement of money as a key reason for being in ministry. And it takes many forms. It includes exalting money beyond what is reasonable. It includes favoritism of leaders towards those who are rich. It includes keeping tight and offering records as a way to know who to give what kind of soft service. You know what? In some jurisdiction, let's be very honest, you need to keep those records for tax purposes and other things. Okay, that's legal. But I'm talking about the situation where you keep it so that if someone has a difficulty, you know how you, you give him more attention because he's a good tighter, he's a generous giver. There's somebody who is not generous tighter, still in the same congregation, you won't attend to the person. Very careful, very careful, so that we don't go into favoritism. You know what? 3.2 living a worldly lifestyle by those in leadership. And expecting saints to finance same. Oh, I need, a, I need a new helicopter. I need a new jet. Then saints must finance it. And, the, and we're not talking about basics. We're talking about essentials. We're talking about non-essentials. Those things with which to compete, like one of the Joneses, the spirit of the world. We're told in book of 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, period. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of Elohim abides forever. So, when you see worldliness driving ministerial life, those who are called to be reformers will reject that foundationally. 3.3, entrenching a culture of superstardom. In which the leader forgets that he or she is to emulate Yeshua in simplicity, approachability, access, and they live a life that, you know, you want to be like somebody up there, somebody who cannot be, you, nobody can come close because you are now a superstar, you are popular, you are famous. 3.4, you know, when Babylon comes to church, the resultant mixture of truth and error, kingdom principles with worldly culture, is simply syncretism. So Babylon is syncretic by nature. It's a mixture life. And then it is very important to understand that syncretion gets to too many things. It includes mixture of Christian ethos with a pagan ethos, including certain things the Lord wants us to do in the body, and certain things that have been borrowed from paganism, some of the feasts of paganism, some of the feasts that Christendom, Christian religion borrowed, like the way the death of our Lord Yeshua, which is fulfillment of the principle of the Passover, was has been sidetracked. And then the cultures, the natural cultures of Europe have been embraced. And you have all this rabbit thing, egg hunting, all the paganistic things mixed now to produce something called Easter. That is nowhere like what the Lord had in mind. It's just like, okay, the Lord himself was probably born in the fall. And religion has invented a, a, a Christ born on a winter. Born in winter, men and brethren, and then they create a festival called Christmas that takes people's eyes away from the king to come 
and puts him on a, a little babe that is vulnerable, needing, needing pity, needing help. And so that people's eyes are taken away from the king to come, the one who is coming to take over the whole world. And brothers and sisters, when you grow in the Lord, you know what Second Corinthians chapter 6, 14 to 18 says, when he says, you know what? Be not unequally yoked together. You don't have all those mixtures. You know the Lord wants us to celebrate him every day. If you wait for one day to celebrate him, what about the other 300 and something days? If you wait for only one day in a week in which you dress up to be, to go to church, what of the other day? So Babylon, you know, creates a culture that hems in the gospel and makes it of none effect. So you have no part of it. 3.5, Babylon hates the collective grace that is wired into the church of Yeshua. So Babylon fosters a hierarchical structure in ministries and the apex is the founder and he's alone, he's up there and the other nobody there is secure. The leader is not able to empower others, is not able to see them grow. It's only the leader, it's only the leader up there. Now, men and brethren, in some cases, is only the leader and his own offsprings that ever go to leadership out of insecurity. You want to create a, a family-owned ministry and then others are hemmed out. No, process. there should be room in the church for everybody. And now listen, there are families the Lord gives grace and the places is called upon them and the parents are able to transmit the truth to their children. The children embrace it. That doesn't mean they won't have space. No, they will have space, but they should not come and be posed there up on top of everybody. No, the children should grow. They should be trained. They should also embrace process and grow. Have responsibility commensurate with their grace and the Lord who takes over the future. We don't determine. It's actually canal to determine who be your successor? That's a canal thing. What you do is empower. Let everybody be empowered. Let the grace of the Lord take over. So that the Lord will do what he wants to do. Brothers and sisters, let me say this for those who bother about, okay, will family members grow? Yeah, James, the brother of Yeshua, he was the chairman of the church in Jerusalem. But it was because he himself had converted, he himself had sold out his life. Je um, Jude, his brother, wrote the epistle of Jude, you know, powerful epistle, because he was sold out, you know. Brothers and sisters, it's very important to have a balance about these things. Let families of ministries grow in grace, and let the Lord do whatever he wants to them in the future. 3.6, covetousness is Babylonian. So reformers will reject covetousness and seeking money and money and money and promoting money and all that and, and taking it for their own use. No. 3.7, Babylon corrupts the church by injecting worldly principles that meet needs and expectations of seekers rather than challenge them to bow to the authority of Yeshua and principles of the kingdom. So reformers will reject that approach of just giving people what they want to hear. And the itching ear drives them and never ever, good, ever able to get to the knowledge of truth because they are just being given firecrackers thrown at them to make them excited so that they can keep coming to court, church and giving offering and tithe. Men and brethren, having said that about number three item, number four, the reformer found by Yahweh will of course need to be made strong in Yeshua and in the power of his might because your mission will be a reformer is a reformer's assignment is not easy. You're going to come against a lot of headwinds. You're going to come against satanic forces, the power, the powers of darkness. Just one second, is there a problem? You're going to come against the powers of darkness. You're going to come against, you know, spiritual forces in heavenly places. They are going to try to shut down the gospel. They are going to try to so. Paul said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So you've got to be strong, not in yourself, but in the power of his might. The Lord will teach your fingers to war. He will teach you spiritual warfare, teach you how to deal with the elemental spirits over the nations and territories the Lord has assigned to you. 
and the Lord will make you strong to be able to overcome, strong enough to deal with rebellious people, strong enough to deal with people who want to scatter the work of the Lord and still loving them. Then, number five, let's talk about how reformers will run Bible-based kingdom ministries. Number one, 5.1, the word of the Lord will exalt it in all its strength and power so that the people will know the truth that sets free and they worship him in spirit and in truth. Not just emotionally, they worship him in truth. 5.2, the reformer will do a self-audit to find out the gifts and offices endowed by Yeshua through Holy Spirit. And he will deploy those gifts to the optimum, pour it out for the sake of building up the church. 5.3, the reformer will know that he or she alone cannot and should not be the only fold that is active in the church and therefore will challenge the other brethren to take them, each one take on. If the reformer is an apostle, he wouldn't want the church to just be an apostolic ministry and that's all. No, he want the prophet to emerge, the evangelist to emerge, he want the pastor with the grace to emerge, want the teachers to emerge, and Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, will just manifest in such a reformer's ministry. It may take time, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but because that is what's driving, that's the GPS that is navigating the mind of the reformer, it will get there, he will get there, she will get there by going consistently. 5.4, the reformer realizes that beyond the days of expounding the vision, training the leadership and empowering them, it is his or her responsibility to be used by the king to create space for the other foes to rise in dimension of their calling. This is so important. It's not just enough to create, it's not just enough to empower, train people and empower them to serve the Lord. It's also important that the reformer must create space. The way the ministry is structured must be such that there will be space for people to be able to come along and do the work the Lord wants them to do in a space that gives room for all the fools to manifest and it is doable by the grace of the Lord. And that is also that 5.5, the, de the, the reformer will also see the need for the deaconate. It's not just the fivefold as leadership, the fivefold concentrate on teaching preaching, prayer, training, and leadership, then the deaconate are those who are called to the marketplace who have grace and have integrity and honor and honesty, and they will be found. It also takes time. The Bible says, let this first be proved. That is to say, people have to be proved with assignments to check them. When you send them assignments, do they report back the change? No matter how tiny it is, are they honest? Do they have integrity to be able to take care of the business affairs of the church? Find them, you give them assignment, and the church explodes. If you look at Acts chapter 6, from verse 1, it was when the fivefold put in place the deaconate, something happened. We're told in Acts 6, verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business of taking care of the practical things, that will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world, and the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas the proselyte of Antioch, and whom they said before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and look at the outcome, verse 7, and the word of Elohim increased, and a number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And this is something that reformers must look forward to. You might try and fail. You might not get the right people at first, but keep your heart on it. That there are business affairs of the ministry that should be run by people who have the competence and grace. 5.6 The true reformers cannot subscribe to any purported move of Yahweh which exalts one five-fold office above the other. You know, where we now have a caucus of apostles. 
and the others are excluded. A caucus of prophets, the others are excluded. There are caucus of evangelists, the others are excluded. He knows that what the Lord raises is fivefold, not one fold, not two fold. And he raised all of them are equally important. Each of them has his peculiar work. They are not competing, they are complementing. In the same way, two reformers do not give room for, you know, gender or race based movements in the church where you have whites only, blacks only, Caribbeans only, Africans only. No, the church has space for all. You also don't create gender based things, you know, like having female sororities, uh, women apostles incorporated, women prophets incorporated. No, such things they tear up. They do not bind up. They do not heal. They do not lead to what the Lord plans. And so, by the grace of the Lord, create room for all to find space, just as he said in Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? Verse 12. For the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, Verse 13, how long till we all come in the unity of the faith? The work of the fivefold should continue until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Yeshua. Then in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children. When the fivefold do their work, we come to a place where the brethren are no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleet of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in way to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Yeshua, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by what every joint supply it, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So this is kept in mind by the reformers that the whole idea is let the fivefold do its work and people take their responsibilities and the body is built up and the church is stable. People are not allowing anybody to come and toss them around. You grow up enough to know that if people are operating in the Colossian mindset and pattern, you know what? Love them, bless them, Honor them, but have no part to do with their Nicolaitan ways. You don't go kiss the ring of a man and bow and call a man your lordship and your grace. You don't do that. You don't participate. If people decide that they want to make merchandise of God's people, you don't allow your neck, your neck to enter the news that they have created if you are matured. And brothers and sisters, they know that at the end of the day, the Lord has a master plan. He gave it to Paul the Apostle. That Paul could write in 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of Elohim, which is given to me as a wise master builder. The church has a master plan. It was committed to the hand of Paul the Apostle. Everybody in the gospel needs to make time to study the Pauline epistles and study Acts of the Apostles. Acts, Acts of the Apostles. He says, I have laid the foundation. Paul was used by Yeshua to show what it will be like, what it should be like, and other build it thereupon. But let everyone take heed how he builds thereupon. Why? For other foundation can no man lay other than what is laid, which is Yeshua himself. Now, if any man build upon that foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, there are six substances we can be with. Gold, silver, precious stones, these are not combustible. They come forth in fire. Fire brings them forth better and better. Then you have wood, hay and stubble. They are combustible. And a lot of people in the world, they are doing church, but they are building with combustible substances. And the Lord says, hey, every man's work shall be made manifest. The day is coming, for the day shall declare it, it shall, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire of the glory of the Lord will try what we did. Did we walk by our fancies? Do we walk by what we thought, our feeling, our emotion? Or did we go to the master plan that is in the Pauline epistles? Because the Pauline epistles describe what Yeshua died for at the cross. What is the effect of it? 
in terms of the nature of the people who are born again, in terms of their focus, in terms of who Yeshua is in them, who they are in him, he says a day will come when the Lord will try everything we are building with his fire. The tri fire will try every man's work. Verse 14, if any man's work shall abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. The crown of righteousness, which Paul said, I'm looking forward to. If any man's work shall be born, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yes, so, as by fire, he will suffer loss. He might squeeze into the kingdom, but all the glories, all the mass of people supposedly in the church, all the structures that were built, all the monies accumulated, all these things will be of none effect. And brothers and sisters, this is serious. The Pauline epistles is not a suggestion this is God saying, this vessel I arrested on the way to Damascus. I am giving him the blueprint of the church. What are you doing as an overseer? Have you checked it through the Pauline epistles? What are you teaching the people? What is, your, what, is the, what is the focus of your ministry? A day is coming. The fire of the Lord will try it. So reformers receive the grace to go to the blueprint and walk the blueprint. Brothers and sisters, can you share this video and let this spark a conversation that people may begin to check what they are doing. It's not enough to gather a crowd, attendance. It's not enough to build beautiful structures, build it. It's not enough to make money of the gospel. If these things will at the end cost one, each of them to cost one to miss all the glory that will come in the world to come and just money to squeeze in and there'll be no room for regret. Is it, does it not make sense for us now to make adjustments? What are you doing, brothers and sisters? How many of you can say, Lord, use me. Use me to be a reformer. Not just reform me, but use me to be a reformer. Now the question is, if not you, who will the Lord use? And if not now, when will you respond to the call of the Lord? Share this video and encourage others to watch and let conversation begin. By way of assignment, number one, please present a summary of the key message you personally learned from this lesson. Two, please mention the five features of reformers that you embrace and briefly describe each. Don't go into lengthy, just briefly for each one. Three, please honestly discuss which of the five features of reformers you yourself need greater grace, rims of grace to walk in. We're going to pray and by the grace of the Lord, the next lesson, we're going to continue. We're almost getting to the end. I'm saying to you, you know what? Let's give the Lord a chance to perfect us in this understanding of the fivefold. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Anywhere they are, there's space for the priesthood of all believers to rise. Anywhere they are not. You know what? Anywhere is rejected in favor of any other leadership system, it means a systemic disobedience to the instructions of Yeshua HaMashiach, the King of the Kingdom, the Lord of the Church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, let your name be glorified. Have your way and do a work that only you can do. Father, transform, renew, and let your spirit cause fruit to come forth from this meeting today. 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching. And we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook, Monday, all the way to Sunday, every day, about 10 30 a.m. UK time. And that's the same at Nigerian time. And you, it's either Apostle George, Monday to Friday uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace, uh, Friday to Sunday. And then in the evening of Sunday, we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6, after 6, another one up to 7. So please join us on the live stream and you're going to enjoy it. We also visit our website, www.gsom.ac to download free ebooks. This course you just listened to, all these lessons, you know, there's an ebook we have free of charge. Everything we do is free. But more importantly, you can actually do your program on, you know, 
ebooks you can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want you can also if you want to do the yes course or be, do the master class you can go to www.kingdomboostclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it you can also subscribe to our channels this youtube gsom.tv and we also have a telegram channel gsom media you can send us an email at aklife.tv at gmail.com we love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of yeshua jesus is empowered with truth remember it is the teach train equip activate and release paradigm absolutely free of charge have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon.